first North End of the School Committee meeting in our new uh, central office for September 10, 2015. Um, we'll start first with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Just a reminder, we are being recorded, and if you would please silence your electronic devices just to minimize the uh, background noise. Um, what you see is uh, on the screens before you and around our, our agenda, or our agenda for this evening. Um, there may be some subtle changes to how we're operating our uh, business meetings. Um, you'll notice that we have a general public comment section rather than what we traditionally have done, which is a public comment section for agenda items only. Uh, we're trying to be a little more respectful of people's time, and if you have something that you'd like to present or provide to the committee, we'd like to do that earlier in the evening rather than wait till the end of the meetings, which may be very long in duration from time to time. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. And also for the agenda this evening, just as a, uh, as a reminder, we are taking uh, public input to the naming of the North End of this High School track. Um, that is a separate agenda item, so we will we'll call that. And then if there are other public comment um, items that uh, anyone in the, uh, in the audience would like to bring, we'll call that as a separate uh, separate topic, just so it's clear, because we have a couple of couple of inputs into public um, public comment. Um, and again, as, as briefly mentioned, uh, this is our first meeting in our new central office, so uh, we hope that the signal is being received outside of the building. I'm sure it is. And uh, I appreciate uh, those in attendance uh, for this first, uh, uh, hopefully, very successful meeting. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, open the discussion for public comment related to naming of the North End of the High School track. And I'm going to refer to our existing policy, policy FFR, which calls for, uh, for naming existing facilities a five-step process. Uh, the first being uh, the recommendation to the principal uh, building PTO superintendent and school committee, which has been successfully completed. Um, the second step was related to a uh, written submission of the proposal where the school chair at the time, Mr. McDevitt, um, made a public, um, uh, would make the public recommendation that has been successfully accomplished. The third step is for the school committee to then open the naming process by vote. That was uh, completed uh, last year as well. And the fourth step, which we were on the second part of, which is that the school committee will solicit input from the public at um, uh, public sessions at the next two regularly scheduled committee meetings um, on this topic. So the first one was May 28th, if the member serves, and this is the second um, public um, input session. Uh, the last and final step is that the school committee will review and discuss the input at the next scheduled meeting, and at that point um, we'll hopefully entertain a vote for the uh, name of the proposal. So as a, as a process review, that's where we are tonight. And what I'd like to do is uh, uh, please, if you're interested in providing input Please come to the table, introduce yourself and your address of residence, and uh, feel free to, um, you know, to, uh, to provide input into the process. Hello, my name is David Testa. I live at 5 Appleton Street, and uh, ever since I joined track as a freshman, Alex Friese has always been an inspiration not only to myself, but my teammates as well. And Alex was the kind of kid that every track athlete should inspire to be. And I can't think of a better way to honor Alex than by naming the track after him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs> Steve Nugent, 35 Hollow Tree Lane. Um, so I, I said before you tonight that this is the, the third step in, a, in the process, and I truly respect uh, <clears throat> making this process available to us. So I, I, the, for the uh, school committee, the school administration, the parents, the, the uh, teachers, the student athletes, everyone who supported us to get us to this point and spoke on, on behalf of this effort, uh, I think it's easy to get behind something when you, when you know it's, it's right and uh, it's the right thing to do. And I truly believe in my heart of hearts that this is the right thing to do for this young man. Um, as his track coach and guidance counselor, uh, knowing him fairly well and, um, you know, the short time he was with us, uh, you know, I feel like um, everyone that uh, steps on the track from this day forward, it really would be an amazing way to have a, a, a lasting legacy for this young man. 
and his family. Uh, he represented everything that we would want in our young men or young women who represent the high school in any sport. Uh, I, the last comment I wanted to make, I think that at that time it was a pretty devastating um, series of events that happened that led to Alex passing. But what came of it, I'd like to see the silver lining in things, and it was a pretty amazing uh, series of events that happened in our town and brought our town together, I think, closer than it had been in a very long time. I'd like to think that if we were on track and we've, you know, hypothetically, if we were able to uh, have a positive vote the next the next meeting, if we have a plan in place that we would like to um, roll out um, so that it could be another celebration, another opportunity to bring the school, the, the school and the, our North and Town community together. I'd love to. Uh, I, I think that the we've we, I, the vision we have is to have a sign that would hang below the the scoreboard up at the track. Mm -hmm. uh, there's already been signage uh, purchased and ready to put on top of the uh, the, the scoreboard up at the track. So it, the um, and that's by the N Triple A. The the uh, sign would be, I think, three feet by 12 feet, which would mirror um, the, the, the width of the scoreboard. Um, it would hang, hang below this, the scoreboard. <coughs> uh, the cost is roughly $1,000. The funding for that would be something that we've already talked a lot internally and, and some of our uh, friends, and it would be something that the uh, school community would not have to uh, endure and, and take on. Uh, it would be privately funded. Um, we envision a, a big celebration, as I mentioned, and something that we could do. Uh, we, we are looking more towards the spring. Uh, we don't want to rush things. We want to do it the right way. I'm a planner. Um, and we envision the day of our Alex Farisi Youth Track Meet, which is in May, second mm -hmm. weekend in May, mm -hmm. would be the day where we would invite the, the, the marching band, the chorus, the, you know, anyone and everyone who would be part of our track community. A lot of our student athletes might be home or near, to, near home at that time. Um, and we envision a big celebration, you know, maybe about an hour long, and then we could launch the youth track meet that day. Great, great. Thank you. Very thoughtful. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other input? Great. So again, I thank you very much for uh, for appearing tonight and providing the second input to the uh, to the uh, activities related to the naming of the North End of School. Um, I can also comment that I, I've received a lot of email support, I'm sure as others have, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this on the agenda at our next meeting, which is... 24th. Is it 24th? Okay, thank you. September 24th, where we hope to have it on the agenda for a formal vote. Um, I also can mention that uh, this is the only um, naming option that I'm aware of, so I appreciate those who are um, very interested in, in providing this feedback and this input to the committee. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Great. With that, I'd like to move on to general public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who has com comment um, for the school committee before we enter our regular business agenda, this would be a good time to come forward. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very kind. Thank you. It was fine. So, thank you all. So thank you for coming. We'll take a, a brief uh, moment so people who uh, do want to depart can. Thank you. Great. And now on to uh, agenda topic number five, excuse me, number six, uh, introduction to our new student representatives and a new student report. They were so very please. excited to have um, a member of the class of 2016 and the member of the class of 2017 with us since their first school committee meeting, is that correct? So welcome. Um, first is Matthew Wolfman. Wolfman? No, yeah, I'm going to get that right, Matthew. I apologize. Um, he is a very well-respected uh, member of the senior class. Uh, People describe him as quiet and unassuming, um, and he leads by example. He's a very solid student. He's been a two-year starter for the uh, Scarlet Knights football team, and he is interested in studying physical therapy when he leaves us at the end of this year. Um, and you work part-time at the North Andover Youth Center. So thank you and welcome, Matthew. Thank you. And then we have Courtney Trong, who is a very active member of the junior class. Uh, people describe her as incredibly positive and upbeat, <laughs> with a smile on her face at all times. <laughs> she is one of the founders of the North Andover High School Asian Student Association, now in its third year, um, is also a member of Interact, Random Acts of Kindness Club, and Racial Literacy Roundtables. 
She's a very strong student who is interested in studying in the medical field in college, and you work part-time at Brightview Nursing Home. Yep. So we're really excited to have both of you, yeah. and this is now your opportunity to share anything with us um, about the start of school or anything else you might want to let the school committee know. I have made it clear to them that after their comment, they are welcome to stay, but then they are also welcome to leave, especially as the year goes on and as work piles on <laughs> or not, they have the opportunity to leave. Very good. Yeah, so as you all know, we just got back into session after a very long and relaxing summer, which is nice. <laughs> Um, and we welcomed the freshmen into the high school and they given them guidance and whatever they need to help them out and make their journey through the high school more pleasant. Um, so we have the athletics all started up, have been going through around midway through August we all started and every team has been working very hard and through the heat, few, this huge heat wave that we just went through, everyone's out there working. Um, most teams have had their first game. Uh, we have our first football game tomorrow. And we're just looking forward to a great year and looking forward to having a very positive and great uh, school year as well. Great. Yeah, but as for us, um, as a sophomore, well, used to be a sophomore and all those other things. Now I'm a junior, and I'm seeing freshmen coming in, being nervous and all. But now it's starting to change, and now they're starting to be more excited to join more clubs, meet more people. And it's really good. And unlike the sports, which is amazing how you guys started so early, the clubs are starting to start. I know Interact Club is having their first meeting on the 17th. John McGill is starting their meeting next week, and the Asia Student Association is having the first meeting on the 22nd. So all the clubs are starting to get back in place. Great. How's the general aura? In school, people positive and yep. looking forward to a cooler, uh, cooler week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. praying. <laughs> <laughs> and for the seniors, we're all starting to get into the swing of colleges and getting through that. And it's a very stressful time, but we all know that it's for the best and make our life choices and how we're going to prepare for the rest of our lives. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks very much for Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're welcome to stay if you if you like, or is this, if you're not, if you have other places you need to be, that's no, certainly welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's something going on at 8:30. <laughs> 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you. So, so moving. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So moving on to our uh, consent agenda, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve regular session minutes as presented in the packet. So moved. Discussion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Discussion on the, on the um, draft uh, meeting minutes. Uh, just a couple of thanks, Mr. Shimon. Um, I was I came in late for those that uh, that meeting. Um, my my notes don't say I came in at 9:38, and I don't know the way the way the minutes are set up. It appears that you know I missed most of the meeting because the vote that you took. I mean, if you just follow the the minutes, you know I was there for the Dr. Bear's presentation or most of it, and Dr. Press's all of that, and then. If you get to page two, three quarters of the way down, it says I'm, I wasn't there for this vote. It makes it appear that I wasn't here for most of the meeting, which is not the case. So I'd like to have them redo the minutes um, to reflect that. Okay. Um, do you have specific uh, changes you'd well, like to? Well, my notes say that I was here about 40 minutes late. I think it means it probably means 8:38, not 9:38. That's probably true. Um, okay, so 8.38 for the arrival time. Mr. And I'm, I'm wondering the vote that was taken on page two about um, <coughs> the open session minutes, just the way it reads. Um, so the, the summary is that you were not in attendance with those meetings and abstained from those minutes. Is that, is that what you're... Yeah, I was the, exactly. I was not okay. there for the June 17th meeting. The way I read the, the, the yeah. this draft, it appeared to me to indicate that I wasn't there when this vote was taken. Got it. Okay. So, and so that's, you know, if you read the, the, the minutes as they, they come along, it seems that, you know, I showed up <laughs> right before you adjourned. So Understood. just want to make sure that's not the, that so was the case. So it's really that you were not in attendance at the June 17th. At the June okay. 17th. Meeting. Okay. Correct. Yep. Yeah, because you obviously voted. Uh, before that, right. Before that. Okay. So, um, okay, very good. Thank you. Um, any other comments or corrections to the draft as presented? Okay, hearing none, um, what I'd like to do is propose that we approve the minutes with the amendments as presented by Mr. Tracy. Uh, the modification of his arrival time to 838 in the 
uh, top section and the clarification in the vote that Mr. Tracy was not in attendance of the June 17th meeting and therefore abstained from that vote. Right. Thank you. Okay. So I think I need a motion to make those uh, modifications. So moved. Second. Any discussion on the amended, um, amended check, uh, proposal? Hearing none, I'll call a vote for the amendment to approve the minutes with that, uh, with the modifications. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? So all in agreement. And with that as our uh, regular uh, consent agenda, I'd like to move on to, I guess, the chair report. Um, briefly, uh, first uh, week of school. So congratulations to uh, all involved. Uh, it sounds like it was a harrowing uh, start with the heat and um, appreciate all the effort the central office has taken as well as facilities to prepare for the day. Um, I'm glad that uh, things went off um, mostly without a hitch and uh, the stabilization into the year is, is proceeding as, as we typically see. So um, congratulations again to the teachers, faculty, staff, and central office and more importantly the parents and students for yet again making 47 plus 100 students uh, show up at a, at a designated place on time. Um, and again, as the year progresses and if, if issues do occur, I know that um, the central office and the, uh, the school supervision is ready and able to handle the issues and I encourage the parents if there are concerns to reach out to that group. Um, secondly, I also want to mention minutes that we approved. Uh, that was our summer retreat when the committee meets and has um, discussion on um, uh, some strategy and some overview of what we're trying to accomplish for the year. So I appreciate the committee joining us on a very long day. And um, as, we, um, as we reported in the minutes, uh, two uh, additional presenters were there. Um, Dr. Price's uh, new superintendent inception um, um, I don't want to say guidance, but how would you call coach. coach, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bale was present and uh, was very insightful. She is, I think, one of the primary architects of the new superintendent inception program. So we appreciate that um, attendance and that dialogue, as well as uh, Ms. Presser from um, NASC, um, NASC, yes, um, who helped uh, uh, some of the um, operational uh, aspects of the committee moving forward as well. So. I wanted to reach out to those two people and just thank them for their participation on, uh, on a long summer day. And then finally, um, during the uh, retreat uh, meeting, we did receive and accept a donation that I wanted to publicly also bring to the uh, community's attention. Uh, there was a donation from Franklin PTO for $17,486 or $487 for playground equipment and a PTO Kittred, from Kittredge donation for um, renovation in the cafetorium uh, in the amount of $19,250. So I just wanted again to publicly thank both PTOs uh, for the generous donations which was accepted at the retreat meeting. Um, that's what I have for the chair's report. Great. Um, so for the superintendent's report, just quickly, um, as you said, we opened up school um, the first day with the faculty and staff. I would like to thank Mr. Winkert for very wonderfully representing the school committee and welcoming the faculty and staff back. Um, we also had uh, Mr. Mailer um, come and speak, and I think that was a nice inclusion of having him come, and uh, he did a very nice job. Um, and we did something new uh, where we recognized four uh, staff, faculty members um, who have served over 30 years in the North Andover Public Schools. Um, and it was a really wonderful time where the principals brought up uh, Jan Janet Gaffney, Andrea Tupperman, Lori Rotler, and Susan Murgo. Um, and it was just mm -hmm. great to hear about their long and very amazing uh, careers here in the North Andover Public Schools. So um, it was a positive, I believe, um, beginning to our time. Um, and then went to two and a half days of professional development, which um, a lot of work on the second day on literacy, especially for our elementary school teachers, um, and actually even more work on the third day around issues of literacy. So there was a lot of our um, reading interventionists, is that right, Mr. Gilliam? Coaches. Reading coaches worked a lot with um, every grade, um, especially focused on K1 and 2 and 3. So it was a, a wonderful opening to school. And then um, on Tuesday, all the students showed up on a hot day, and we made it. Um, and people hydrated and um, you know things have really settled in you know always at the beginning of the year there's always bus issues I think we've solved most of those um, mm -hmm. and um, I've been in every school most multiple times in the last few days and uh, everyone it's just humming it's, it's really nice to see it humming I think that's the best 
that's the best way to describe what's happening right now. Um, and uh, ECC came in yesterday. Kindergarten sh showed up yesterday. So um, it's, it was really, it's going. Great. Have I, did I miss anything, Mr. Gillen or Mr. Mealy? I should say that um, uh, Mr. Gilligan and our new superintendent had a wonderful event for our new teachers. Mr. Gilligan has now made, made, made a new tradition for us of having the North Andover bus tour, which he did do, and then they all came here to central office and they had a cookout. And the chef of the day was our new superintendent, so I think you all have to know that. It's, I stopped by just to say hi, and it was a wonderful occasion. Everybody seemed to be having fun, even though it was 90 that day. So, But everybody seemed to be having a great time, and I had a burger, and it was very tasty. <laughs> Thank you very much. I cooked it appropriately. You did. <laughs> okay. So I just want to let people know that we were doing stuff even before day one. Yeah. Okay. And the new teach is all filmed in bios, and that should be, it's up on cable now, and Mr. Motherway should have it up on the district website uh, next week. Great. Right. Looking forward to that. Um, so just to add, uh, I'm going to do something at the end around uh, the Boston Magazine rankings. I just wanted to quickly address that, but I'm going to start with just asking Mr. Mealy to give a quick facilities update, and then Mr. Grant's going to come to the table and talk about our um, Chromebook rollout and also our upgrade in infrastructure. So facilities update, um, we had a kind of a nice respite this um, summer. The past couple of years we had some major projects going on and that wasn't the case this year. So the focus was on cleaning and uh, painting and you know touch up where we needed to and mm -hmm. a couple of projects you mentioned. If you go over to Kittredge, uh, you'll be blinded by how much brighter that gym and cafetorium is. Just a cafe gym, a cafetorium. Yeah, exactly. Or a yeah. 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 Yep. cafetorium. Yeah. Um, the one most visible project we had, the major project we had, was the renovation of the track. And if you get a chance, take a look. It came out great. Um, and it's funny, Mr. Gross was talking about um, if the public see things or experience things they need to stress, don't hesitate to call. It occurred to me when I was getting up in the bleachers at the track to, to get a good look at the paint job on the track um, that they're not as secure as they should be. Um, and it occurred to me that the more eyes we have out there, uh, the more aware of these things we can be. So if people do see things, um, bring them to our attention so that we can take care of them because we don't get to see everything. Um, so other than that, yeah, uh, things you know started out really well. Um, and if anything does occur, let us know. not so amazing. Um, so I just want to give a brief update where we are with technology, uh, Chromebooks, and any of the infrastructure upgrades to the, to the network. Um, so we'll start with the Chromebooks and basically the, there was a couple questions I think that were out there is why did I purchase, decide to purchase rather than lease? And the reason was twofold. Uh, the first is with Chromebooks and any technology product they are updated quite frequently. So every year they're coming out with a new product. Um, and in the area of Chromebooks and Google, they change things very quickly. And I didn't want to get stuck with a three-year lease and have six or 700 Chromebooks that were three years old and were still paying mm -hmm. on those Chromebooks after three years. So we were able to get a, a really decent product, and actually this is the product that, that we ended up purchasing. Um, and we were able to get 350 during that for, during this first year. And, and the second reason is it made sense to start small based on some of the concerns people had around the lack of a curriculum for K through 5 around technology. So we developed some of that um, over the summer, and I'll just bring it to a quick web page here that, that will... Um, so we're at 350, is that the well, there's 350 at the elementary, this, and I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, let me just bring this up. So this, I, great, I created this website for the staff, uh, and what it is is a digital literacy curriculum based on the state standards 
and other standards as well throughout the country. Uh, so K through two, if you click on the, the K through two link, it will take you to the standards for K through two. Um, and the same with three through five, six through eight, nine through 12. I don't wanna go through this whole website. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically for each of the standards, um, we're developing and finding websites that meet those standards that are either Google Chrome websites, um, software products that are compatible with the Chrome device and, and putting, embedding those right into this website. So when teachers go to this website to find out what can I do to meet this standard, this, there'll be a list of websites and resources for them to go to so that they not have to go out and, and look for them themselves. They, can, they do have that opportunity um, on the left hand side where it says Common Sense Media and Graphite. Those are two resources where teachers can go to find digital resources for their classroom. And they're, most of them are compatible with the Chromebook. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly easy website to navigate and I, I presented this to the three through five teachers and the K through two. So they've all seen the website. Um, we did a, a PD with the Chromebook so that they know how to use them and it went very well. The teachers were very receptive to the, uh, the Chromebook. So uh, I'm very hopeful that the Starting off fairly small. I mean, 350 is not that small, but it's smaller than what I had wanted originally. But I think it's a, it's going to be a better. I think it's going to build desire for them, and they're going to want more. And I, I have a feeling that that we're going to, we're going to, we're not going to be able to sust like keep them away from these devices because it's, it's already. And I'll show you in a second. Um, I'm going to let me go back to the presentation here real quick. So the, that's, those are the reasons why I decided to purchase rather than lease, because I think it just made more sense to, um, made more sense to do that rather than, like I said, wasting money and, and having a three-year-old, paying for a three-year-old Chromebook. Uh, the next is the 75,000 that was dedicated to the elementary Chromebook. We were able to get 350 Chromebooks at $195 uh, a piece, and that's including the Google software that's required to manage them. And that was the total was 68,250, and we got eight carts to, to house some of those. We used some existing carts in other buildings. Some of them used actually uh, a lab environment. And that was about 11,000, so for the total for this particular was $79,450. Uh, the plan is to use the same 75,000 next year, make an additional purchase of Chromebooks, and after three years would have roughly 1,000, maybe probably a little bit more um, throughout the district, one third of which are brand new devices, as opposed to getting and, and yeah. getting them all up front and then having three-year-old devices, which they're gonna have to kind of upgrade all at once. So I think doing it over a period of time makes sense, at least to me. Uh, so the examples that we have, so we have at Thompson, the lab on the left is all dedicated. So that room was actually had PCs in it. They've decided to take those PCs out and reutilize them in the classroom. So as in kind of like maybe two or three in a classroom so that they would have stations within the classroom and then use this as a, um, as a lab environment. And then that's one of the carts that we purchased, which are much smaller, more mobile and they're so easy to, to manage and use. Um, so they, they, they've worked out really, really well. So that's an example of two different setups that we have throughout the district. Um, the last picture actually shows, I took this yesterday in that same classroom. We had, I walked in there and they were already using them. So the, the, there's a third grade classroom and the teacher was up there, she, she told me that she was concerned, she would, like, thought it was gonna be a disaster, but she said it was, the ki every kid was able to log into their own account. Um, and we've, we've simplified the process of logging in so they don't have to type in that big long email address, mm -hmm. just the username, the first part. And they were able to all get in and they actually went to a math website that they each had a, a separate pin number for their own set of, uh, at the website and they were doing math resource um, problems. So it, this is the first day, actually day one, we had teachers using the, the, the Chromebooks. Um, at the high school, the other 100 Chromebooks that I used a different part of the budget, I put 60 at the high school and another 30 at the middle school. So there's 
there's more at the high school now and middle school and actually the high school is looking at buying more um, and the middle school already has a bunch so that the Chromebook rollout actually went very well um, I, I in there like I said they're very easy to manage and we're actually starting testing next week with the NIWA and we're going to be able to reconfigure the every Chromebook in every school literally in about five minutes for the testing and when the testing starts they specifically use an app and we can set these in kiosk mode so they can't go anywhere else but the app mm -hmm. and then they take the test and then we can reconfigure them back to just um, a regular classroom device so this is for what, Mr. Niwa, which is a uh, it's a it's like a, it's replacing some of the other standardized testing that they're using for um, you know if you want to Explain. Yeah, so you guys see our common assessment schedule every day that we roll out. Um, and we had the opportunity this year, we had uh, been testing in grades three through five in particular with the grade testing, um, mm -hmm. you know, with the different stay nines and how that correlates to MCAS. Um, you know, and over the years, um, it hasn't been as useful as of late. Um, so in grades three through five this year, we'll be working with NWEA. It's used in hundreds of thousands of schools all over the country, and they test in reading and mathematics. You can do it two or three times a year. It takes about 45 minutes in a lab environment, and it's all correlated and tied to the Common Core and the different standards by domain uh, and strand. And it pops out immediate information with no middle people um, that can help teachers make... Um, important decisions about their instruction in real time. So, and these will work very easily with that. So that would be our simulation of park if we were going yes. to do park, right? Same idea. Very similar. I mean, from a technology, not from a testing, but from a technology. From a technology, it's very similar to what we did two years ago with the park. Um, yeah. Those tests are web enabled or are they locally served? Web enabled. Okay. So it's, well, it's exercising our imminent bandwidth as well. Yep. Cool. And that's, I didn't put it in the uh, um, presentation, but we up, we increased our bandwidth. One of the biggest projects over the summer was changing from Earthlink, which was our service provider, to Comcast. Mm -hmm. um, Earthlink was just horrible to deal with, and it, it, a lot of people are switching away. And, and actually, it turns out we made a, a really good decision because now Earthlink is no longer on state contract and the town has to switch and make the switch to another provider as well. Oh, so okay. we were able to make that jump and planned it well in advance. Now the town is kind of not scrambling, but they're going to have to make a decision and go with another another provider as well. We decided to go with two different providers to provide redundancy within our network. So mm -hmm. if, if, any, if Comcast goes down, we can jump over to, I think they may go with Verizon. And as far as our phone and internet. Yeah. And if Verizon goes down, then they have Comcast as a provider that, because all of our network is one giant network. Right. How's how your experience been so far with Comcast? Awesome, they've been great. Because with Comcast, they own they own the network. They they install the, the products, and I've dealt with two or three installers throughout the whole summer at, at every building, and I've got their cards, and and they've <coughs> said just give me a call if there's a problem. With Earthlink, you got to call Earthlink, then they put a ticket, and then it's. Verizon is the one that comes out, and it's like it's not us; it's them, and yeah. all the finger pointing. So Comcast is nice because it's they provide the service and the, the equipment, and they can't point their finger at anybody else because it's one person, a one company. Great. So it's been it's been good, and we've actually we were able to inc with Earthlink we had a 50 meg fiber connection to mm -hmm. the internet. Um, they were paying 2,000 a month for that connection. And we're, we've got a 350 meg connection with Earth with Comcast at the same price. So we've increased the capacity without any cost whatsoever. And that's for all schools? For every for the whole district, the right. town and the schools. Yeah. And the so we're now okay. at um, 750 megabits per second, mm -hmm. whereas a little over a year ago we were at 50. Yeah. So it's been a huge, huge increase. Um, so I know you're going to move on to infrastructure. Yep. Do you envision that to be a, um, an impediment we have to monitor in, in terms of, um, you know, as we move to more online material in teaching and learning activities, uh, do we have to worry about our bandwidth capacities? Um, we weren't even hitting our bandwidth capacity prior to this. Uh, so our network manager monitors that, and he makes sure that the network is stable, and, and he does a really good job. I mean, the, the network manager, Dave Broder, on the town side, he's out of the library, has been an mm -hmm. incredible resource for, for the schools and the town. 
Yeah. Um, but he he does all the monitoring and making sh makes sure that the network is is um, stable and, and our connection to the internet and our bandwidth is we're not c reaching capacity or anything. Okay. That might be important to, to look at as one of our key key measures as we roll out again some of our yep. well, online content. I, I, I mean, we're getting close to what the ideal is, which is a gig, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is so far beyond anything I ever imagined we'd be able to get to that I'm not oriented. You know. mm -hmm. I mean, we'll fill it up sooner or later. We'll, we'll Eventually. We'll fill this up, but, yeah, but I it, don't think that's going to be a problem. Part of, part of that upgrade is a core switch upgrade. Mm -hmm. So. At the high school, middle school, and we picked a small school, uh, Kittredge, to to upgrade the network. And the core switch is really the, the the brains of every building. So the high school and the middle school are the two biggest biggest buildings. Um, the edge switches, the ones that are in the closets, uh, are pretty. They're fine. They're they're not a they're not at end of life or anything. The core switches were reaching end of life, and they were only one gig connections back to town hall. So we've upgraded mm -hmm. to 10 gigs, and we're, at some point we're going to add another 10 gig to each. So we'll be at 20 gig connection between the high school, middle school, and the town hall, um, which will support all kinds of in, any infrastructure resources that we need, whether it's video, surveillance, anything like that, we can add to the network. And the 10 gig, actually 20 gigs eventually will mm -hmm. handle all of that. So those upgrades were um, were done at each of those locations, and all we recabled everything. Um, I worked with the in installer, and and we made sure that everything was kind of cleaned up and made and made neat, and because it was driving me crazy. And the next picture, I'll show you a <laughs> couple of the pictures. So on the left was the original high school um, cabling, and and then the right hand side is the, is the same thing, except we've recabled everything with smaller, shorter cables higher capacity cables and um, just reconfigure the switches so that it made sense um, and it's just much easier to identify any issues or problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then the same with the middle school. Uh, the left was the original uh, setup which was a mess <laughs> and the right is the newer. So the yellow is, I've color coded the cables, the yellow is Wi-Fi, red is like more important connections like to Cisco routers, phone routers, things like that, and all of the other fiber connections. So it, it's a lot easier and cleaner and just cleaned everything up as we went along. I don't have Kittredge. Kittredge does actually look like the one on the left as well, but mm -hmm. it's a lot, lot cleaner now. And when, you, when are you going to get to the other school? Um, that's probably next year. Mm -hmm. uh, I had 100000 roughly to spend on that this year, and that ate up a chunk of it. What's the reason we chose Kittredge is, and we, and we don't have the, the both fiber connections uh, set up yet, is the redundant fiber is not E-rateable. We can't get reimbursed for that through E-rate. Mm -hmm. So I pulled those out and added Kittredge in so that when we get re reimbursed the money, I can use that reimbursement money to purchase the upgrades that we need for those other two locations. Mm -hmm. So we get a 40% rebate uh, from that. So we mm -hmm. spend 100000 we'll get about 40000 back. Mm -hmm. And then we can use that forty thousand for additional um, upgrades to the network when we get that funding back. What is E-rate uh, refundable? What sort of things? Are like upgrading core switches, upgrading hardware. They're they're migrating away from uh, their. They used to do phones, phones and communication. communication. Right. They're they're phasing that out and going more to hardware upgrades and infrastructure. So equipment uh, upgraded to ten gigs is their big push. And so that's so we were approved at the forty percent funding level, and we're going to get hopefully fairly soon. I I don't know how long it takes them to get that money back to us, but once we get that back, we'll roll it back into uh, more. The uh, mm -hmm. one hundred and four thousand was that the capital? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So when we put that line item in, we were going to buy servers. Uh, originally. Yeah, originally. Right. Right. Yeah, we don't need times have changed. We mm -hmm. don't need servers anymore. Yeah, actually, exactly. we've actually shut one down yesterday. We don't need that, and we're slowly trying to migrate away from the town and the schools are working closely together to look. The town is going to be purchasing a single server, mm -hmm. which is fairly expensive, but it can actually it can actually spin up 97 separate virtual machines, so we can have one box that we could literally have 97 separate servers, virtual machines built into that one box. 
so we could have unlimited number of resources just with one. And it also does backup and redundancy, and it's, yeah. the technology is amazing what, what, what's happening. So as I've been learning in my entry plan, um, my entry process, you know, this is a wonderful example of town and school yeah. um, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of the technology departments working, you know, hand in glove. Um, and the great thing about this is that the decisions that are being made, as Mike has articulated, are being made in concert. So the town is not making one set of decisions and the school is making another. Right. And, um, you know, meeting with Andrew Mailer just on this issue yesterday, you know, special thanks to the FinCom and to the Board of Selectmen. Um, you know, this could not have happened without the support of the town. And it, as Stan has <coughs> articulated, it is a massive upgrade, mm -hmm. um, both in infrastructure and in devices that are in the hands of our kids. The interesting, uh, I think an interesting fact we shouldn't have said, it, back to the Mr. Amazing Mike Grant, is it turns out I think now we're leading the town, right? We're, they're following us, and they're going to probably be going to the Google world and mm -hmm. Gmail and all of that. So. The, we're know, following. They're following us in some ways around the Google world, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we're following them in some ways. So I think well, it's a very. They've been. They've been. You know, very good to us about the infrastructure. It's been, so it's been know, that's been great, and they've. They were very prescient about, you know, the the our town network and all of that, and the yeah. fiber that they put in for the town, which has been a big help for everything we're trying to do. Oh, so. absolutely. So it's been, yeah, like you say, it's, it's been, been a good working relationship. Great working relationship. Mm -hmm. working relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Chris McClure, the new IT yeah, director on the town side, has been great. Uh, he's he's a Google person as well, so he's pushing him in that direction. So it's so the town will actually have a Google Apps for for government, and we will actually sync both of ours together, so that. If you're going to email somebody on the town side, their emails will populate or will show up within our email system, and the same on on the school side. So, they'll at some point once they get up and running, then we can get all that working. Right. But on our side, most of the things you're trying to do are all web-based, so mm -hmm. we don't need servers. No, hardly all. Yeah. Right? We're not running apps anymore. No. Interesting. Any other questions or comments, or what, did you have? That's it. That's the last one. I had I had a quick question. Um, the rest of the technology, the MacBooks um, mm -hmm. that we purchased in the past years, how are they holding up? Um, any issues reimaging and sustaining those? No, no, no issues with those. We we did lose a few to damage, um, which I expected. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, they've been holding up well. We we did send a few back that were um, that had mechanical issues that were covered under the warranty mm -hmm. and got those repaired but so far so good they're they're working fine great no problems great and the other question I had was related to uh, security and privacy at the at the at the town level are we um, you know paying for managing um, you know the consultants to make sure we indeed have a secure environment and then secondly for these very portable devices or do we have provisions in place to make sure that they're in secured environments that they don't disappear um, for the, the Chromebooks, yeah. So the carts in the labs are all, they're lockable, so all the carts are, have keys. Um, and the, the classrooms are, are locked. Uh, these, actually, very few of these will disappear because once, because they're tied to the school network, mm -hmm. uh, there is, one. if one disappears, we just go in and hit a button and it becomes a brick. I mean, so nobody can use it, nobody can re-image it, they can't sell it for money then no it's just it's pointless to even take one because they're so not these, useful these, for anything. These just to be clear, the, the Chromebooks that we have are only usable in the school department. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. that's a very very insightful and very uh, useful message to uh, to share. Yeah. So if if one were to be taken out um, and it disappeared we could just like deprovision it and it just becomes useless. Great. Great. Awesome. Anything else? Good. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. the no update. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So I was going to quickly add, um, I know some of you have been asked, and I have been asked, about the recent Boston Magazine rankings of different districts. Um, and I was just going to take a moment to share some thoughts on that with you. Um, We've done some analysis. So as you may or may not know, we were ranked as the 73rd um, district out of 125 districts within the 495 loop, basically. Um, and um, so I wanted to kind of look at that. Now, I want to draw your attention to the methodology. 
Um, they basically say nothing down in that paragraph. So they basically don't explain to you really how they do it, but they try to put some words there. So I don't really know how they got to 73. Um, but I wanted to just kind of pull out a few things. When you looked at the inputs, so things like average class size, student-teacher ratio, per pupil spending, we are clearly at the highest end of the 125 communities. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at outputs, we are actually ranked on average in the 40s, 43. It's hard to know exactly, but somewhere in, in that in that regard. You'll see that, um, for instance, our percentage attending college is the sixth highest of all 125 districts. So, wow. um, so a few kind of takeaways that I just wanted to share with you um, is that when you just look at outcomes, um, we're doing better than the 73, um, which I think is a real testament to the educators within the North Andover Public Schools and the students mm -hmm. and the families. Um, often these rankings, so we also just had a niche ranking come out where we we're 49th in the Commonwealth. They're all very different, and mm -hmm. they're done by lots of different people. The niche, niche, for instance, uses qualitative data where people go in and say how they like the North Andover Public Schools. Mm -hmm. um, often these are done by people who don't really understand how schools work on a daily basis, um, and they're almost impossible to understand um, and to really understand what how, how they get to different numbers. I think that's really important. Um, I've spoken with uh, Andrew Mailer about this and uh, Mr. Mealy. The per pupil spending is something that we really want to look into because in North Andover we do some things differently than other school districts. So for instance, the health care is paid out of the town, not out of the school. Mm -hmm. So we just want to make sure that when we're looking at per pupil and there's other issues, for instance, just Mr. Grant and the technology, the support we get from the ta right. town around technology, that number we're worried could be a little misleading and we want to really understand that better. Um, so that we're really um, comparing apples to apples because we're concerned there might be some apples to oranges in that component. Um, and then, you know, this goes to kind of the whole relationship between inputs and outputs is not always clear. Um, if you increase the inputs, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to increase the outputs. There are many districts that are spending more than we are that aren't necessarily having the same outputs. Um, and so, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation causation it's just mm -hmm. and I think that's demonstrated by the fact that we're in two very different mm -hmm. places on that and then the last thing is you know I'm always concerned about these rankings that they just don't take into um, uh, into account other really important factors and I think one that they very rarely take into account is student demographics which I think is huge yeah. um, and I think that it's an important part of understanding a school district so um, I just thought I'd share this perspective on this with you I, quick question, if I may. So, when you mentioned, for example, you know how we spend uh, on healthcare. Yes. So, by that, are you? Are we just not? When we look at our budget, are you saying that the budget amount that we're using for healthcare is really represented on the town side? So it's hard for us to actually know. So, some school districts, some some towns, cities, um, the healthcare comes all through the schools and doesn't actually come through the town. So we just gotcha. want to make sure, and Mr. Mealy, as he's doing his end of year reporting, is going to really pay some attention to this and making sure that when they compare, if for instance one district, the health care comes through the school side, is that reflected the same here in North Carolina? In the per pupil and we just, I just think because the number, we okay. just want to make sure we have it right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. well, and, I, and I think we're relatively close, but we have not done the level of scrutiny that we want to do to make sure we're comfortable with that number. Well, I don't think there's a way that we could basically look at that and then, you know, however we account for it. Yes. Just because we account for it one way, I mean, I, I don't know if we would necessarily change it or report it out differently so that we were then comparable to everybody, but right. at least it gives us a point where we understand that, Correct. you know, I, and I'm making this up, out of 125, maybe 25 seem to model kind of how North Andover right. does it and, and that just kind of guides us a little bit with that. Not that I think the per pupil spending is going to go, you know, if we include health care from, you know, almost $12,000 per student to $25,000 per yeah. student, but um, <laughs> it might be nice, but, <laughs> um, you know, it... So the yeah. average among those communities Curious. is actually about thirteen seven. So there are okay. some communities that are very high, yeah. but the average is only about $2,000 more per okay. student. Okay. Interesting. So let me... The other thing I, d I just wanted to add is I think I really appreciate you providing this 
to us. I, I think in the past it would have been helpful to have things like this in response to this Boston Magazine or whatever it is, just to say, you know, be careful when you look at this sort of stuff, but with some facts to go along with it. I would respectfully submit that you and the school committee chair might think about posting this on our website for the public to see. Um, so they can get some idea about it, you know, maybe with a little preamble or something, just so people can know, you know, that we're doing well, you know, particularly in the academics, which really, you know, graduation academics looks like we're doing really well. So that's good. Yeah. So the ultimate output looks good to me. And that's what we want to know, right? We want to know that that's something good going on here. And we've provided a response to the community, so they're not just sort of scratching their heads. It's like, how come we're never number five or something. So that's, I think that's a great thing. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. The other thing I was just going to add, and you know, I think our attending college rate is, is obviously great. I mean, we're just under 92 percent. But um, I always think it's interesting we never report um, our armed services. Um, so the students who kind of go into that, and I think that that's an important, yes, um, mm -hmm. I, I, just because the students aren't going to college, I mean, the, the yeah. armed service is just as important. I don't know if we're going to have those values for the other communities, um, but I will say it just bothers me that we don't recognize that. Agreed. Good point. Yeah. Ms. Warren? Yeah, I just have one quick question. Oh, Mr. Mealy, does net school spending <coughs> better represent numbers to compare? I'll say this with regards to especially per pupil spending. Mm -hmm. I don't know if DESE does a very good job of comparing apples to apples. So if you look at it, what they come up with per pupil spending, it's a very good comparison. I don't know if they use them as their source or not. But I will say that in just about any comparison that is made, we are about $2,000 less than the average. No, I appreciate you putting this together. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate the analysis, but just for the record, I could really care less with Boston Magazine. <laughs> I mean, it's a magazine. There's more ads and stories in it. If it was, you know, a legitimate educational, um, you know, publication, I'd, I'd give it a lot more thought. But um, you can you can figure out the the analysis and the rankings. Um, you know, d depends on what you put into it to figure it out. So. I do appreciate you looking into it, though, but I... That was sort of the tenor, a little bit, of my second bullet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Good. And I, my, my comments as well. I agree we, we do need to focus on the outputs, but I think the underlying message is we are a very lean organization. And I appreciate the focus on making sure that we're not lean because of reporting phenomenon, that we're, you know, we're comparable versus not. But, um, you know, the, the results speak for themselves. And I know there was a little bit of concern in the community when this report came out and when the um, certain media picked up on the low growth of the low ranking without focusing on the good things. So I do agree with Mr. Lippert. I think we, if we can provide this as um, some collateral or even um, as part of the response to um, the, the media results of the, of the apparently low rating for our school systems, I think that would be appropriate. But I also share Mr. Teresi's comments that these are extremely volatile. They may not be scientifically vetted and they may not be in a methodology that honestly compares uh, communities. So I'm more concerned with our outputs rather than where we fit in a relative ranking. So. Good. Thank you. So uh, moving on to agenda item 10, old business. Um, we have a presentation for the superintendent's entry plan progress. So um, I'm going to put the PowerPoint up there. You guys have it in your packet. Um, so just a quick re few reminders. As you know, um, in June, I sent a letter out inviting people to participate in my entry process. Um, and there's a copy of that letter right there. Um, and then I asked a series of entry questions, which, as you know, we started crafting in March, I think, pr mm -hmm. quite quickly after I was appointed uh, the superintendent. Um, got input from the leadership team, got input from school committee members about the crafting of these questions. So um, there are um, seven questions. Um, that uh, I have asked hundreds and hundreds of people, um, some in person and some uh, through uh, a survey. Mm -hmm. um, you will see that I had a number of community entry meetings. So I met with um, a lot of PTOs throughout the summer. And you'll see the dates. I have a few more coming. I'm meeting with the Atkinson PTO and then uh, North Andover High School PAC still. But I had a number of meetings at people's homes and restaurants and Grogan's Field all over North Andover. Um, <laughs> and then um, I also had a number of staff um, and then continuing to have staff <coughs> meetings um, 
throughout the next few months where I'm meeting with staff. The one staff I've already looked, met with is the high school staff and I asked the questions and got feedback on these questions. And then um, uh, you will see that I've had a number of municipal entry meetings where I've met with um, key uh, people within the school community, um, sorry, within the town community, within the town. Um, the number of the folks where the TBA asked that I meet um, once school began, so that mm -hmm. is we're working mm -hmm. on setting those up, but those are all part of the plan in the next uh, few weeks to meet with folks. Um, a lot of those meetings haven't been as scripted with uh, when I'm meeting with each um, selectman individually. I'm not asking them the seven questions, but it's really an opportunity for us to meet and get mm -hmm. to know each other. Um, and then um, you can see that as of uh, last week, I had 870 people log on to my survey. Um, and here is just the breakdown. Uh, the vast majority have been parents. Um, but I think that that number in staff will go up as the folks have returned to school. Um, and um, my plan, as we had articulated at the um, retreat, was that I will be sharing the results of my entry on the November 12th school committee meeting, um, just to kind of what I have found in answers to the questions and impressions and things that I have. Um, but you'll see I, I've met with and talked to a lot of people and solicited input from a lot of people. Great. Comment, Mr. Uh, I'm also assuming that you know, you've, done, you've said you've done um, an audit of, you know, plans and all that sort of stuff, and you'll summarize that, I assume, for us. Yeah, so it's not before. just the entry finance great question. It's right. also, you know, looking at contracts and looking at the evaluation system, and there's a lot of that that has happened. The nuts and bolts. The nuts yeah. and bolts. And, you know, I'm also finding out a lot of things as the year goes on, too. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, you know, give yourself a few months in schools. The other thing is, um, yeah, I think I've already done 22 school visits in the last few days. So, you know, just getting into schools um, mm -hmm. and being as present and seeing things in action is really part of this process, too. And I would hope that if it would seem appropriate that you would give us a sort of a list of action items that we need to deal with once you've summarized this. In yeah, so as we, just, as we will look at my... Um, at my proposed goals, that's going to take some time, but that's the mm -hmm. next part that won't be in November. That I think is in uh, in March or April. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've been very transparent in your findings along the way as well, as you met with each of us, and oh, right. I hope uh, as as uh, each of us have the time to uh, you know, to participate in those discussions. So uh, I look forward to that. I'm um, 800 and. <laughs> People are responding to that's, my survey. That's very impressive. That's and we are coding the responses. Yeah, that's the other thing. Three times town meeting. <laughs> that's a, what, what, I think, what I think was really remarkable is the fact that you are codifying the results, so we yeah. can look for trends, we can look for, even in the free text, you know, yeah. when people do submit feedback, um, it's really the way the analysis that you've shared to date has really been insightful to where the key issues and where the key opportunities are for us, and I think that that's... Uh, that's very important because if, if if the results are not actionable to help the the organization, then it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of talk but no action. So I, I, I appreciate that as well. Just a, a quick question: If the if you're presenting the findings on November twelfth, is the survey down? Is it? Yeah. So I think um, I in my October newsletter I will okay. say you have to respond by October fifteenth because we okay. really do need to get. Right. It was coded. Okay. I didn't know if it was already down or not. No, and I, it is and I was still, hoping that it was it still open still as open. people returned to school and got yep. back into that Absolutely. mode. Absolutely. Um, and I encourage people again on the um, North Andover Cam to um, continue to get on the survey and, and Okay. Them. And a month then still gives you roughly enough time to. Yes. Okay. That should be plenty Great. of time. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So with that, uh, moving on to the uh, school committee's review and approval, the superintendent's proposed goals. So I'll take a motion to, um, well, let's see. This is old business, and we have a motion to accept these. So um, do you want to present them first, and then we'll take a motion, or anyway? Sure, I would happily, I mean, we did present them at previously. I may just go over the changes that we've made, yeah, if that would be helpful. Is that right? Right. most helpful to folks? Mm -hmm. um, so the first is effective entry and direction setting. Um, and I just wanted to go over the timeline, which is to what you said, Mr. Limbert, is um, I will present my findings on November 12th. Then the goal is really by May to propose three to five key strategies um, to improve student learning and other district systems. Um, and then by September, really having some time over the summer, is really to come up with um, to identify priority actions linked to those strategies. So that's the plan in terms of the time um, and laying those out. Um, 
Ms. Warren, you had asked for um, kind of some evidence of each of these, so I put some in there. Mm -hmm. So one is the report of the entry findings on the 12th, whether or not we identify the key strategies. And then one idea that we had, which is in line with the new superintendent's induction program, mm -hmm. is um, to do a survey of key stakeholders, just say, did we get the key strategies right and did you feel like you had any input in them? Mm -hmm. So that we can say to folks, have you, have you really had an opportunity to, to have any influence on these key strategies? So that's another idea of, of evidence. Um, and that was a change. Um, maintaining momentum during the transition, uh, that goal, I think the change here was um, this is really about um, making sure that I'm working with administrators around their goals. Um, and I think the thing that I would say here is um, we did the analysis of that demonstrate, demonstrates, I would look at benchmark two, at least 75% of the administrators meet and exceed their goals. So really going through the goal setting process mm -hmm. um, with the administrators, we're just actually working on developing some forms for that today. Um, so there's not too much change there, um, except for something you had asked for, which was just showing you some samples of observations of classroom visits with principals, um, and then also some of the sampling of principals' goals, um, so that you can see what they are working on in terms of their student learning goal, their school um, improvement goals. Goal three is really just participation in the new superintendent's induction program. Um, the evidence there would be a letter from my coach saying that I was doing what I needed to do. Um, which I plan to do. Um, and then here is uh, goal four was around the teacher evaluation. The biggest change here is um, that we actually as a, a leadership team decided to adopt, and this is under benchmark, a team professional practice goal surrounding um, the, during the evaluation process. So the idea is that we would really work as a team um, and what that's going to look like operationally is once a month we are going to meet, for eight months we are going to meet at one, each of the eight schools walk through classrooms, um, have conversations about what we've seen, and then actually spend the next hour, hour and a half, talking about our evaluation process. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in October, we'll be talking about goal setting. How did we work with our teachers around goals? How have we shared our goals? Um, and we will be talking about our observations. Um, very much a, a looking at student work type of protocol, but looking at our work as administrators. And um, we will be have that goal adopted in the next few weeks. Our goal is to have that by September 21st. So that's a change okay. that okay. I'm excited about. And then I worked very hard on goal five. Um, I would say that I got incredible help from my coach, Carla Bear, um, on this. Um, and um, this is all new, so I might give you, if you haven't had an opportunity to read this, this is a very different, um, we talked about this, but I never had any language on it. And I will say I have shared this with the town manager, given that one of my key actions is to develop a positive relationship with him, I thought I should tell him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my guess would be that that's not a problem. You probably already achieved that in particular. <laughs> Yeah. key actions. But I did think I would, should share it. Yeah, you. that yeah, <laughs> seems fair. And you envision these to be around some of the low-hanging fruit that we've, we've been discussing? Yes. I mean, I think that Good. there's some, and, you know, and I think that there's some real benchmarks. I mean, Bev is going to keep a, a, a log of my 100 school visits. My plan is to start every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in a school. Mm -hmm. um, so I think 100 is a very manageable goal. Um, Good thing we're a small district, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and then the last piece of evidence is, uh, again, um, just a survey to the stakeholders in the same survey as goal one with just, you know, have you interacted with the student superintendent? Have you read anything she's written? Um, you know, has she seen her visit her school? Have you seen her visit the, the classroom? So that we get a sense of, you know, you know, I could say I'm visible, but am I really? Right. And another thing I really liked about this goal, and again, this was um, and helped with uh, my coach, was, you know, to build internal and external confidence. I really liked how it was worded. That the, you know, you're not just being visible to be visible. You're being visible for a real purpose. Um, and I think that that's really important to underline. I think that's a great additional yeah. goal. And uh, I, I love the key actions that are there. So mm -hmm. looks good so far. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah, comments? Um, the, the only thing I would say, there's one small typographical change. Okay. Goal four. Yep. The apostrophe should be after the S in principles. Oh, yes. Thank you. It's good that we have more than one principle. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Lippert. Um, I, I, I'm going to just jump in. I had a couple quick questions. The evidence, um, some of it falls into the next calendar year, and I'm curious, how do we want to 
handle the onboarding and um, the induction program with regards to mid-cycle evaluation? And then will we have the evidence in time for the year-end evaluation? So as we, as we think through the, the evidence and the timing, I just want to make sure we, we have enough to complete the other processes that we need to, we need to fulfill as well. Um, so, Mr. Gross, my thought about that is that is that something we should talk about? Because as we know from the last experience we, when we did this, the first year is a little different than right. subsequent years. So it's really about induction and less about, if you will, hardcore performance. So there's a little bit of that blend in here. Yes. And I think we need to have that discussion and decide what we want to do and how we want to do the evaluation because it's not fair for Dr. Price to expect her to, you know, have the wherewithal to act as a sitting superintendent who's been here a few years who can engage in a different way. So we I, just have to decide what we no, want to I do. No, I agree, but I think the intent of the, of, of the strategic um, goal um, alignment was that it did also align with, with the other objectives. And I just want to make sure that, that we at least have some, um, uh, some, some focus and alignment on just to make sure that we're not scurrying around doing um, two or three different processes when indeed they're really the same. And if, if everything lines up nicely, I think it would minimize the amount of extra work. That's, that's that my point. Right? Yeah, I, I would respond that I think the only thing that really is pushed back is the percentage of completed administrative evaluations by June 30th, which is, um, and that really is in, in, we had a long conversation with the principals. You know, it's very challenging for me to be working with them on their evaluations when they're trying to complete their teacher evaluations. So we purposely pushed that back a little to give us some time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, other than that, I think there will be quite a lot of evidence for you to have by June 1 or so. Um, and I think that, for instance, we would just make sure that that survey, as an example, was done in time for your um, yeah, oversight yeah. of me. Sure, sure. The, the only other comment I had was the 75% on the evaluation plans for um, the administrators. Um, this is meets or exceeds. So yep. that's, that suggests that it we may have, well, not that we may, we would love to see that as 100% as obviously, but I'm just curious where the 75% versus we would like all of our administrators. Mm. So I think that that takes into account that sometimes if we're really going to ask people to have stretch goals, we actually, they learn a lot when they don't meet them. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I can say from my own personal practice is mm -hmm. sometimes my greatest learning as a leader has been when I haven't met my goal. Um, and one of the ideas here um, when developing the evaluation instrument was to push people to have goals that aren't just always easy to meet. Um, and that there is, you know, often there's kind of a, there's a, a Likert scale of sort that you can kind of, you know, you don't do anything, but then you have some progress mm -hmm. or substantial progress. And so I think really, and that comes from the new superintendent's induction program suggestion, but if we had 100%, then we would be asking, making sure I would have impetus to make sure that people had goals that I knew they could meet. Right. And I think right. one of the things here is to push people to have an opportunity to not meet their goal um, as long as there is a thoughtful reflection about that moving forward. Do you mean that 75% of them met their goals? Are we talking about 75 percent of their goals or 75 percent of them met of the all administrators their goals? met or exceeded their goals so that would be 75 percent of the principals so if you had four three of them met every single goal and one of them might not have met every single goal or yeah. are we saying so that probably they each have three we'd be looking more at 12 than trying to get nine of the 12. that's what i was yeah. so yeah so we're really talking about the actual goals the not goals the not just, yeah okay. so wait yeah yeah, and I don't want to harp on the numbers. I think what's important is, as you've said, you're, you're setting up um, perhaps something new Correct. in terms of establishing stretch goals. And I agree with you. If, 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 if we need to, we need to be able to fail in a safe environment. Although not meeting a stretch goal, one would argue, is not really failure. Right. Um, so I just want to make sure that the, it, it's not ambiguous to what we're trying, what we're right. trying to get to, and that's a meaningful benchmark and, and consistent with, you know, is it really that we want each administrator to meet at least 75 percent of their goals? Rather than seventy-five percent of the administrators to meet or exceed. Right. I think that I think that I can re refresh that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And given there's only three, it probably would be like sixty-six <laughs> percent. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. And then, will there? So, I think you're right. I think sometimes you want them to have stretch goals so that we are striving for more, and that it might sometimes not meet it. But will there be some sort of? And I'm assuming there will be some sort of follow-up as to next steps or. Yeah, so most administrators are actually asked to do a two-year goal process. Okay. Um, so that really is kind of the benchmark for the state. So the mm -hmm. idea is to continue working with, with that. 
Um, I will say that the evidence around completion of administrative evaluations by June 30th, that should be 100%. Right. Um, that is my goal. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a process check, I think we do have to approve the goal or the, um, goals. the proposed goals as a committee. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, unless there's further uh, discussion that you'd like to provide as part of the background to, the, to what we're seeing, I'm going to entertain motion to approve as discussed with whatever amendments appropriate. So um, and sure. second? Second. And discussion? Now that we've already discussed the, <laughs> the intent, um, do you want to take a second to um, clarify the, the benchmarks that we discussed, or are you, you comfortable with, with where we are on the... Uh, I think I, I'm comfortable. Okay. Great. Any other comments? I was just going to say that you know I, I appreciate the work you're doing on Goal 5 here, mm -hmm. and the feedback that I've received from the community over the last eight, ten weeks has been fantastic, and you've been really accessible and, yes. and open. I just think going forward, Goal 5, and maybe it's it's a little little less intense, but it should always be, and I'm sure it will be, you know, one of your goals every year. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. It's also fun. It is. <laughs> Good job in the office. More days in the week. Mm -hmm. Roadshow. Great. So, so any other conversation or any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of accepting uh, the superintendent's FY16 goals as presented, say aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, unanimous. Next item is review of the, of the school committee subcommittees and liaisons. And this comes out of our uh, retreat uh, from earlier in the summer. Um, presented in the packet is what I believe we uh, um, decided as our, our way of working through for the subcommittee liaison appointments. So I don't think we have to vote on these. I just want to uh, canvas the team to see if there are any corrections or any other thoughts uh, related to where we are. Seems like what we said, so that's good. Okay. So with that, um, just the only comment I have is I, we, we do have an email distribution for the PTO, PTA, and NPAC um, uh, uh, presidents and co-leaders. Uh, I do expect to send out a, uh, an, an introductory message um, to see if there is interest in uh, school committee representation at their at their meetings. So uh, as soon as we hear back, we'll, we'll see about uh, those assignments. Okay. So moving on to new business. Um, we have a uh, um, informational update on payroll consolidation. Really? Yes, actually one of the first things I'm starting my seventh year here already, which is hard to believe, but um, when I first started, they had been in discussions, and Stan will probably remember this, uh, regarding the possibility of payroll consolidation. Um, it didn't happen. It's always kind of been on the back burner and has now been brought to the front burner. Um, town manager and Dr. Price have been in discussions, along with myself and uh, Lynn Savage, about how this can work, and basically, what will happen is um, the half-time position that exists down at Town Hall will be made into a full-time position and all payroll functions will be done through that position. That will allow us to eliminate our payroll um, position. Some of the funds go to fund the half-time position, but it's still a savings um, to our budget that we can use in other ways. Um, what we will do is um, still have a position within our office that people can call if they have payroll questions um, as kind of a liaison between school employees and uh, payroll. Um, so we think it will work. We're, we're working with the town manager and uh, we think it's a good idea. And this came up before the two issues that were raised before was, you know, we have, I guess, three times the number of employees that the mm -hmm. town site has. So could they handle it? That was question number one. Question number two was, a lot of the uh, the contention at the time was, and I don't know anything about this as d details, but many of our payroll issues are much more complicated on the school side than the town side because there's various kinds of retirement things and insurance things and all kinds of stuff. So there was a lot of, you had to know what you were talking about and you had to have a lot of good experience to be able to sort this stuff out. Both questions could be easily answered. Yeah, I think technology is the answer to both. Um, basically, the input is done now anyway at the um, building level, whether mm -hmm. it's municipal or, or a school, and then it's um, approved by the, the building head, in our case, principals, or sent myself at central office, and then it's just sent on. Um, and then as far as managing 
the retirement that's all done through the software system. Um, so we're pretty com comfortable with it, but uh, the way we're transitioning will be to have our current payroll coordinator, Lucy, um, available to make sure the transition occurs and is, is going smoothly before we do it completely. <clears throat> but it's pre-approved basically before it gets to the to town site. Right, and, and the way our system works, we only work for the most part there. We have some hourly employees, but for the most part it's exception reporting anyway. Right. Because so many of our employees are salaried. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that I would just say that, that I believe the concept is that actually from the month of November and December, the town and the school will be working hand in mm -hmm. glove to make sure yeah. so that the first month we do it is not the first month where the town, which is January 1, that is our goal. So right. there is, that, yeah, the reason we want to bring this to your attention now is so that we have a very thoughtful transition plan. Um, January 1 also works really well because we've been transitioning to a new software program called Munis, yes. which right. is going to go into effect January 1. So it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons to have that be the time. Okay. So a quick question, and I don't think that it's a problem, but for teachers who are um, retiring mm -hmm. or trying to get information in for the um, pension board, would they still kind of then go to our own HR in order to get that information, or are they now going to be basically at town hall trying to get that? And uh, No, for the time being, we will still be maintaining those records. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I just think we're going to change anything like that. We need to make sure that the teachers are aware if we have retiring, retirement so the, the spending. The idea of having a liaison on this side is that there will be very little impact on the teacher's understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, the other thing is almost all of our teachers get direct deposit. So, you know, what used to be coming down here and picking up a check is no longer a reality. Right. So right. Uh, it, we would be surprised, and the first call will be to us in terms of the liaison, and then we will work with the town okay. if necessary. Yeah, actually, actually, in the last contract, we negotiated that it it's required. mandatory. Yeah. It's required for new. For teachers. Right, correct. And right. very few. I think we're to 19 employees that pick up wow. their checks. Yeah. Still. Very impressive. Um, is there communication going out to the, the employees? That That's part coming? of the plan, okay. yes. Yeah. Yep. Just to make sure that people are aware and if there are errors that they, have, they know who to call. And right, and the intent is for Lucy to visit each school to make sure they're comfortable with the process. Great. Good. Anything else? Good. Thank you. All right, next moving on to um, first reading of Crest Capital Fund. Um, is this update from you, Mr. Leonard, Yes. Or? Um, this is... Um, uh, Really, a pro forma vote on our part at some point, and we could do it. Any, any, you know, we can wait till the next meeting. They're trying to set up a capital fund uh, for themselves because they don't qualify for school building, state school building funds. A collaborative do not, so they have to provide their own funds for their own maintenance, major maintenance or construction if they want to do it. So this is just a, a way, just like we have stabilization funds in our town, to set aside a stabilization fund. And would have some of the same characteristics of our stabilization funds. They put it in from their budget and then they have to get like a two-thirds vote of the members of the collaborative to take it out for projects. But it's a place to put it that, you know, they can channel money to this and, and park it there and it's all legal according to state law so okay so is it, there's no action on our behalf tonight. we have it, it would not tonight uh, at our next meeting we, we would vote to approve the implementation of the stabilization fund so yeah. they need for, for yes the they need two-thirds of the members of the collaborative to vote to approve a stabilization on the formation of a stabilization fund. okay good so what are they do for capital right now uh, they th that's been the problem they haven't had any they haven't had the ability to do that, so they've been on an annual. They do it on an annual basis for like per project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they, they can't. They, they have no accrual ability. Are they looking to build their own central office? I mean, do they rent still up or at? Um, they uh, they're going through a pretty big revolution. They're actually moving to a new facility that's over by the you know the Methuen Rotary yeah. on the other side of there, where there's some office buildings. They're moving into one of those buildings over there on a lease basis at the lease or is fixing up for them. That'll be one of their major facilities now. But they're trying to do some major renovation of some of their facilities and they don't have the money. So they're trying to start to accumulate money to 
upgrade the campus uh, up on uh, Route 28 and right. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So they just don't. So they would be able to use this capital money to pay for that lease over at Griffin Park. Uh, no, this would just be for improvements, not for that would be operations to pay the lease for the building that they're moving into. So that this is for upgrades or like construction or major renovations of a facility, hmm. and they are anticipating having to do that for their current campus once they finish the relocation. So. These are the projects they summarized in the. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there is. They still going to that fence along with 28 if they move? Okay. I mean, no, I mean, are they going to move out of there completely? No, 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 no. no, no they're they're gonna gonna it's it. expanding, right? What do you mean fence? So so that fence along with 28, oh, $26,000. Yeah. 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 I thought you were. No. No, it's going to, they're just going to rethink these facilities for other purposes once they move out. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I assume at our next meeting we'll have a um, old business of, of vote mm -hmm. to support that uh, uh, fund. I'm sorry, I do have a question. Um, so, so they have four hundred and eight thousand um, dollars, which is quite a bit of money. Do they do they know how quickly they intend on raising the money? I assume it means that they're going to be a, it's an increase in fees. Um, it will take some time, probably two or three years, to do that because they, as you as you can see in this write up. They raise that money by uh, from us, mm -hmm. you know, our uh, monies we pay them, and as well as the tuition that others pay. So they can't do it all at once. Obviously. So it's going to take like, several years to raise the money and put it in the fund and start having enough to start to spend for this project. So it's not a right away thing. Okay. So it, I can't remember when. when you So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. When, when they do increase yeah, fees, do, I remember, do we vote on that or how does that work? They, they have to get approval to the state. To the state. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other part of this is that they've done a very good job mm -hmm. of coming out of a bad situation. And um, we've talked about this before with food services where in an enterprise fund or an independent organization, you want to have three months of operating expenses. So they're getting to that point where now they're actually generating more money and that's where they want to put it. So they have the amount they should have for the reserve. And then, so it's not all coming from increased mm -hmm. fees. That's what I was wondering is if this was somehow opening up the doors to significant increases, which I'm sure they need they don't, these things. Right, they don't foresee it okay. requiring okay. a lot of big slush fund. Yeah, exactly. Taj Mahal up there on Broadway. <laughs> but they would still need two thirds yeah. membership vote to move monies out of this fund anyway. So it's not like they'll be opening, they'll be right. operating open. They can independently. Right. Two cards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Great. So I'd like to move on to a discussion of the FY 2016 school committee goals. And again, we touched on this briefly at our retreat. Um, this is in your packet the last two years of the school committee goals just to serve as a uh, uh, as an entry point into which ones from last year we think are relevant and need to carry forward uh, versus which ones we think uh, we want to move out of our uh, out of our goal list to introduce new well i mean just looking at this i mean the first thing that i see is the strategic um, planning and financial management and i think we have done the transition mm -hmm. to budget based so i mean i don't know I'm not sure we moved to performance base yet. I think that's still open for. It, it may be a, a tenant okay. for this this year's budget generation, but I'm not sure we're there yet. I agree with that. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. All right, I misread that. You know, and I just went on that first one, um, and, and I saw this was part of the conversation in previous years. I'm not sure that the goal is level one status for all of our schools, given that um, there are eight districts in Massachusetts who were level one last year. Um, eight and districts that are similar other than standalones and vocational, just like we presented that data last year. It was really shocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
the drop. And given the potential that the, the board is going to be voting on moving or not moving to park in November, there's a lot of um, a lot of things in the air around that. And um, you know, I think as we think about student achievement, I'm not sure that that's the only benchmark that is really what we want to drive our student achievement is, yeah. is my concern. No, I, I, I fully agree with you. I think that came into the conversation a few years ago when there really wasn't anything that was a, a vision to um, aspire. So I, I think I personally would be interested in, in understanding what might be suitable aspirational goals for our performance. Um, and linking it to our budgeting process, that, that's something that we've had lacking in, I think, our, um, in, our, in our budgeting process for a while. But when Mr. Mita presented the so-called performance-based budgeting concept, it was we would now take areas and apply money to them to achieve a goal. So the question is, how do we measure that? And we, we struggled, and we've always struggled to have quantitative things we can measure. So if we say, okay, we spent money on X, what happened? You know, I think any of us would be happy to get rid of that quantitative goal if you give us another goal or other goals. That's fine. But it's got to be something we can measure. And, and each one may have a different measurement. Exactly. So yeah, I don't think, I, I, I'm just let me speak for myself. I'm not hung up on that per se. But I'd like to have something I could measure. So if we spent money incrementally more money in, on something, we can say, yeah, here's what happened, here's the result, one way or the other. And, and you know, not to preview an October uh, agenda item, but we are going to ask principals to come and give their kind of update on their and their data story. Um, mm -hmm. And one example is um, the significant increase in math, seventh grade math scores as a result of the change in, in math and science, uh, applied math in the seventh grade. So there's going to be an example of a decision and uh, impact. So that's one. That's just an example that might help us yeah. think of appropriate examples. And, and I think for, with regards to the school committee goals, our goal, it, it really boils down to how are we measured at the highest level as an organization. Mm -hmm. And there are very few measures that are publicly um, available other than level one status or level status through NASC. And that's another thing that we have to be sensitive to, that this ideally would be tightly coupled with each of the school improvement plans so that there's transparency between what we're trying to achieve as an organization down to the tactical and operational ways of, of achieving that. So again, if, if, you can, if you can recommend or if, if others mm -hmm. can recommend another overarching um, organizational objective other than level and status, understanding that it's almost impossible to acquire. and. Um, you know the linkage between the budget and each of our schools to that status is is, is will show up in different areas. Um, I, I, again, I'd very much like to hear about that. Yeah, we can think about that. But, but again, my vision of this, the way this would work, is I look at those uh, assessment reports for each each of our schools, right? And those bars, and there's a, a gap. And I've always imagined that the principal would come to us and say, to close that gap, I need X, whatever that is. And then the next year, they'd come back again, and the gap would have closed, or it had to be smaller, and we'd go, great, how much more you need this time? Never happened, right? We never got there. And it doesn't have to necessarily be that report, but that's the, that was always the idea I had in mind, is how that would work. And it would be a case-by-case -case basis, you know, and that would, that would be the classic perf performance-based budgeting. And that is our plan to begin in October. Mm -hmm. working with each of our principals to kind of, and they have spent the last week talking to their staff about their data story, um, mm -hmm. and we've been working very closely with them. So you'll see evidence of the beginning of that yep. in October, I hope. Okay. We're excited to talk about it. They're all still, <coughs> all the information is preliminary. Not preliminary, but it's all still embargoed and can't yeah. go public, so, mm -hmm. as you guys know. And, any other comments on the strategic planning objective other than the measure? We, we think that we still want to move toward performance-based budgeting and have that as part of our underlying tenant for, for the budgeting cycle? Okay. okay. Operations? I, I, my personal opinion um, is I think an example of what we heard tonight, we've made so much progress in the technology area that I don't necessarily see that being this particular kind of goal I don't think is appropriate at all now because we've, we've gone way beyond this now. We could have another kind of technology goal but I'm not quite sure what that would be. In the operations area, I think we might want to think about it, and we talk about this all the time, but we, we might want to make it a goal so we try to do something about it. Facilities and class size, right? 
we talk about it and we talk about it and we don't nothing ever happens right so either we don't have you know recommended class sizes by grade level or we do and we need to get more classrooms and more money and more teachers and I don't know I, I think that you know more than just the enrollment projections I'm, I'm saying with if our, if our enrollment is even flat forever we're still we still are busting at the seams and we're always going to have the problem about bubbles right even with an overall flat enrollment so I think those are issues that we as a committee might want to think about t discussing and having as a goal right? how do we deal with that and, and what do we want to do and you know we can <laughs> one out one out one result could be there's a lot we can do you know well I think along I think along those lines too when we think about facilities of not just how many people can we jam into a room but thinking about what are our goals educationally um, where are we, what are we striving for and are facilities set up to achieve those goals um, you know in the types of rooms that we have and you know creative spaces or flex spaces or whatever we have I mean I know it was great to see the um, the computer lab space at Thompson you know is that something that we want to see at all of our schools and is that supporting what we're doing for teaching and learning in the classrooms um, I think as we think about so again not just how many more rooms do we need to have an extra classroom and the bubble grades but thinking about what kind of space we need to have good teaching and learning well the other thing too might be a, a totally different kind of response not building more classrooms but say providing teaching assistance for those classes where they have more than a certain number of students right so providing more resource in the classroom which we can do immediately we don't have to wait five or ten years to do it that might be an appropriate response an immediate response to helping improve teaching and learning in classes where there are larger number of students so I mean we could be thinking about lots of ways we could address the problem it is, and it's not just building classrooms I mean we will have to do that at some point because of right. you know you know retirement of things but that's a long lead item so if we're going to try to solve the problem right now, in our that, lifetimes right that's, that's the goal is for us to establish something that we're going to take ownership of Right. And we're going to try to implement um, process policy or yep. other other actions to deliver to that. So, and this would be you know this would be the the right time to start thinking about that because that would be a thing that would 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 drive budgets, right? We said okay, we want to have half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen more teaching assistants to go into classrooms where there are too many students, right? Over the whatever it is, right? So if, if we were to you know, kind of emerge that or move that along. It would be to develop a plan to mitigate, for um, well, address class size, facilities, and and responses to whatever we find. Right. Well, one of the things that I would just throw out there, and I, I'm going to be wrong in my years of the capital improvement plan, but I think that within the next year we are looking to start planning for six additional classrooms. Well. If they're funding slotted for $1.5 million based on our enrollment projections of what we will do, um, there's a lot of factors in there. There's a po the possible need for additional classrooms, but there's also the end of life of the existing portables that might necessitate additional classrooms if enrollment projections don't. Um, so based on uh, the enrollment projections, which will be... Um, getting before the end before budget season starts we should have a good idea of um, those projections and that was on CIP 2017 though, correct? correct two years two years correct well, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable in our operational objective for this year you know to complete that planning so that mm -hmm. we have something substantive yeah. and I, I would just add that um, my initial conversations with uh, Andrew Miller have been you know what makes the most sense in terms of you know there's a lot of dialogue, not a, a commitment to a single plan, but mm -hmm. what makes the most sense as we deal with these enrollment issues. And um, a lot of conversation uh, is ahead of us. And I think Mr. Mealy and I both agree that one of the most important things is really to make sure our enrollment projections are as confident as we can be, um, right. because a lot of decisions are going to be made based on those. But, but I think the important part is for you to help to tell us what we need to do to help you improve teaching and learning, not just class sizes, not just class sizes, right. because that's the problem we had when we started out with technology. 
we were using 10-year-old views of how technology worked. So it was like numbers of boxes in classrooms. PCs per, per student. You know, right. and so that's all out the window. So it's not necessarily just the class size. It's effective teaching and learning, and it could be more staff. It could be the way that things are organized. It could be all kinds of things you could tell us that would make more sense than just building more classrooms. So let, me, let me propose that we develop, maybe we can draft and share with, with Bev um, what that operations um, goal might look like. Mm -hmm. And I think the things that we're thinking in, in terms of you know, the appropriate space for teaching and learning, appropriate um, facilitation for student-teacher ratios mm -hmm. um, and things of that nature that um, would you be willing to take the first draft of that, Mr. Lemper? Absolutely. And maybe we could we could talk about that in our sure. next review. Of the, of and the and I'm, I'm thinking of it in the same sort of very summarized way, not a paragraph. No, it's I agree. A, I agree. Very one line here. Bullet, but yeah, 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 yeah. So my only request would be, you know, we've got two weeks until our next meeting. We'd maybe see something next week, and that way, you know, we have a little bit more time to to think about it. through that. I'm the guy, not traveling. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever. Good. Mr. Tracy, anything, from else? Airport. anything else on ops, or do you want to move to the next? Well, okay. All right, so community relations. I think we've successfully Done. completed our search process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that worked out Done. Really so far. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything in community relations, or are we, are we going to drop the goal? And Can I bring up a subject we have probably never talked about? The performance report. So behind the scenes, we've been doing a performance report for a number of years now. The first one we have on the website is 2010. That was the first one that was done. And we still have one that's completely drafted the 2014. Mm -hmm. And we should be starting one now for 2015. The idea behind the performance report is, if you will, a report from us, the school committee, to the community about the status of our public school system. Some have said, oh no, we don't need to do that. It's covered by that two or three pages in the town report, right? I do not believe that is adequate to tell the town how we're doing. However, I wouldn't, necess wouldn't necessarily say that the current report is what we want either. Mm -hmm. So I would respectfully request that we, the committee, think about that topic. So it would be you could call it an annual report, you could call it a performance report, whatever you want to call it. I think of it like it's a corporate annual report, right? It's a summary of action for that year, that fiscal year. And it summarizes for the community some number of statistics. And you can go back and look at those and see, you know, what you think about what we've tried to do there. But, you know, I think something like that is a useful thing to be doing. And I'd like to respectfully submit that uh, that might be something we want to take a look at. And, and I'm happy to accept the fact that everybody says, that's stupid, let's not do that anymore. Um, but having said that, I, you know, in the, in, the, in the view of kind of trying to be maximum transparency, mm -hmm. think of it in that context. Our, how do we tell the town what we think the status of your school system is at the end of every period? So. I think, I think it's a good point. I mean, I, I don't think that we've paid a tremendous amount of attention to that um, as a group. And, and the development of that, it was more kind of a, um, almost a presentation and approval of kind of what that is. So um, that, that's an interesting perspective. Okay. And again, what, what comes actionable out of that is that to propose um, a community relations objective to deliver an end of year or some of the report by the school we committee. Review the format and content of a prospective annual report for the, from the school committee. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that having um, consolidated report is not a bad idea. Um, I know that there is a, um, you know, the, the one in the warrant is pretty, pretty light and may not give us the opportunity to do the types of uh, analysis that we heard tonight with regards to other things that might be important to share with our, our community and others who might be interested in our community. So, um, again, I think that would, would, the, would the group be reason, uh, would we be reasonably agreeable to have that as our uh, 2016 community relations objective? I think one thing that might be helpful is just 
I'm not sure exactly where mine is on the Google Drive, so mm -hmm. um, if we can have Bev perhaps send that out again. Then, then I think that would just kind of put it back into context and, and give us some opportunities to actually talk about what changes or modifications we'd yeah, want to have in there. So. back and look at the, you know, 10, 11, 12, and 13 and see what right. you think. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's evolved over time, as you can see. So go in reverse order. Right. Right. So, so Bev, please make sure you send that. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank I'll you. have to go back to look at it to see what's in there. But I guess what I'm wondering is, is what would we put? Because, I mean, our role is policy and budget. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, Well, what would it be? Well, I think this is yeah. the point of the of The town would ask, we gave you $43 million. Mm -hmm. What did we get for it? And right. where, do they, where do they read that? Where do they go to find out what they got for $43 million? So do you mean the budget? Yes. They, they give the school department, so they give us, the school committee, $43 million a year. What did they get for it? Where do they find that out? I guess what I'm wondering is, do we, do we even have the information to tell that story? Well, you can go do we, do. as a school committee? I'm not saying that the school department doesn't, but or, I don't know. But well, I, I'm not saying that it's. So I'm not thinking that it's uh, we're, we're developing that, but right. maybe we're looking at where there needs to be some modifications and some changes of what that messaging is. And if I remember correctly, it's a pretty lengthy um, report so, that's there. So but getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah. <laughs> it could. Yeah, because. Yeah, so, but maybe we just need to figure out kind of what that message needs to yeah, so be. So to that point, and, and to Ms. Warren's point, maybe, again, let's take a look at what the last good was, yeah. find out if that information is um, still readily available, mm -hmm. and then as a group, do we want to establish that as our, our community relations or community um, um, reporting goal for this year? Is that reasonable? Yeah. Any other comments on community relations? Nope, moving to governance. I would just say in my office I have exemplars that go back to the school committee reports from 1856. <laughs> <laughs> They're really interesting. So yeah. very good, very good. Let's see what they did, did for their technology objectives. Thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It was cool. <clears throat> right, we, we bought seven yeah. quills and eight gallons of ink. Uh, um, in terms of governance, I was wondering if um, we're collaborating with the administration to develop, and I was wondering if you could mirror the, the same language as my goals, key strategies, and priority actions, just so that there's consistency mm -hmm. between mine and yours with the same language. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the district improvement plan was uh, an imperative from what we were, I think, in need of at the time. Yeah. I just thought so that there was it's good, good consistency feedback. of language. And I do think that um, we've had enough discussion about policy that we probably have to keep that on. Mm -hmm. um, the sub bullets under that might not necessarily be the ones we'll be thinking about, but I think there's enough issues about policy that we want to keep thinking about. Yeah, I, I would agree. And in fact, I think there, that work probably needs to move, move quickly now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do we want to strike the specifics and just maintain that the objective is to yeah. update policy That's as necessary? Okay. Yeah. That makes All sense. Right. Is that reasonable? All right. Anything missing? I know four is a good number, five is, is harder. So we feel strongly we have a, a, a pressing goal that isn't represented here. Okay. Great. So um, in summary, it sounds like, Mr. Limpert, you'll take a, a stab at the operations objective. Um, we'll ask uh, Bev to see what we can do to post in Google Docs the previous um, uh, you know, this, uh, formative or summative reports to see if we can you know, mm -hmm. come up with something mm -hmm. rational there. They're and actually on the website. So say again? They're on the website. Well, the, the historical ones aren't. No, they're, they are? They're all on. We'll make sure you Okay, well, okay. fair enough. And then uh, we've, we've done the other reviews as, uh, as, as we see necessary um, with the district improvement plan correction and the removal of the sub mm -hmm. Okay. Any other topic discussions here? Hearing none, um, last, well, second to last item of new business is the Educator Hall of Fame timeline. And the action here is that we review the following Hall of Fame timelines in order to have a Hall of Fame ceremony coincide with the NAPS ceremonies honoring teachers who have achieved professional teaching status. So I don't know if you want to take a, a Yeah, so that's a, a new idea for next year um, is when uh, uh, to have a ceremony that honors uh, teachers who have achieved the professional teaching status. Um, 
and uh, the idea would be um, to combine the Hall of Fame uh, recognition and then have that Hall of Fame teacher actually be part of the address to the folks who have achieved professional teaching status. It's a nice way to tie in a recognized educator with folks who have um, hit the bar of, uh, of professional teaching status within the North End of Republic Schools. So the idea with that would be next October. So um, the idea would be to kind of coincide this process with that. Um, that's, that's the recommendation we have to the committee. Okay. But, but we would start this year looking for a candidate, right? Yes. Right. right. So that the timeline would be we would seek nominations in April, nominations would be due in May, and then in June we would um, make a decision, and then that person would have time to create a speech, and we would honor them in, at the same time in October. Mm -hmm. Sounds very good. I, I, I think it's a great idea to, mm -hmm. to recognize that meeting the bar objective. I, I don't think we've done that in the past. I think it's a great, a great uh, Great marrying of those two. Yeah. So, okay. Um, any questions or comments on that? I, I don't think there's any problem with that. No, I think it's I think it's great to celebrate teachers who are you know, meeting, exceeding the bar, and and, uh, and joining the professional community you know, through the through doing that. So I think it's fantastic, and I think bringing the experience and still someone who's early in their career, I, I don't. I think it's a wonderful way to start off the school year in October. So. So the only thing that I've heard, I, I like this idea and I think that it's great. The, um, I think it was this year, um, somebody actually gave a suggestion to me that we honor um, the purse cash recipients for service um, to the schools. Um, and I don't necessarily know if we need to, to combine all of them, but um, the, the question kind of came out of, you know, when do we honor teachers? Um, we honor, you know, the parents who volunteer and give, you know, thousands of, of time, hours, and, and all of that. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's something that we just want to think about, and, and I know that we're not really kind of involved in, in the planning of that event, but they almost had a, a re I don't want to say a request, but a how can we also participate in recognizing the teachers as well? Um, oh, and, it's part of the perceptual. Right, and so, so when they initially, I said, well, you know, we have this amazing Hall of Fame, and you know, maybe that's a possibility. I like this, but I just kind of want to mention that, you know, they, they also kind of had a larger picture in terms of the community as well. And it, it's not necessarily that we have to do that or, you know, but something maybe to think a little bit about. I'm into honoring teachers as many times as possible, so um, I'm happy to think about that. I mean, we also did introduce this 30 year at the beginning of right. the year this year, so we are something we're really focusing on is is calling attention uh, to our teachers and, and their incredible accomplishments. So okay. the more, the merrier, in my opinion. Okay. Just some thought. Yeah, I'll look at that. Great. Um, the only question I have is the the policy that we established for this, which I think has specific timelines in it. Do we have any issue? With uh, with that, this is this is our policy, or is this the? This is just the application. It's the application. Right, but I thought that we specifically had a Hall of Fame policy. Right behind it, there's behind the, it. The, the the criteria for recognition, the selection process through behind it. There we go. How old is this? Can we know? Uh, uh, 2012. Well, it was 10, and then it was updated in 12. Right. So, do we have any issues with the with the scheduling based on that? Do the committee vote? Accepting nominees 60 days from nomination deadline. That should give us plenty of time. All right, so I don't, I don't see anything else. Could I ask what's the rationale behind just having one award per year but to the Hall of Fame? Um, well, <laughs> the idea was uh, to not get too carried away about having too many awards, you know, to, to sort of just limit it and do it one, one, one each year and just keep doing it continuously until we get them all. Sure, later we would catch up. Get them all in. Yeah, get them all in. <laughs> get everything named one for a teacher. Yeah. yeah, one per year. So, um, you know, uh, that that could be changed and that could be modified, but um, that seemed like an appropriate thing. And it would focus on a teacher, uh, you know, a retired teacher each right. year, so it wouldn't be, you know, sharing the spotlight. Yeah. But we it did, could be. We did good two years ago, we recognized two teachers, mm -hmm. and then we made the decision. We, we just had two teachers that were absolutely outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so everybody that we kind of talked to felt we should really recognize both of them. And then we kind of made the decision to skip a year. So we didn't actually recognize somebody um, in 2015. Okay. 
Yeah. So, just for some arbitrary reason. <laughs> uh, at, at the time, you know, the ones available? no, no, no. We didn't actually uh, go through the nomination process because we had picked to the prior year, and we really kind of wanted to not make it. You know, hey, we've got 15 teachers we're putting into the Hall of Fame this year. It was more kind of yeah. um, a, a smaller importance. group. Yeah, right. they wanted to do the importance. So. We could look at having more, but just jumped out at me. That's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Great. So um, one item that's not under new business. I did want to announce that um, our executive session before open session was to review the memorandum of agreement with our North Andover uh, Cafeteria Staff Association, our, our cafeteria workers. Uh, we've successfully closed negotiations and uh, have executed an agreement, which will cover, um, if I recall, until, uh, Jim, help me out, this is in the next three years. Next three years, thank you. Um, and essentially, it's uh, provided annual raises consistent with the rest of municipal and other, um, uh, um, other unions. Um, the, uh, um, the incremental rate is uh, two and a quarter for this calendar year to next and uh, to the third year of the agreement. It also clarifies uh, probation status um, based on periods of work and work hours. Um, it also, uh, based on a, a great recommendation by the union, it uh, reorganizes the contract to make it much easier to, uh, to s uh, find sections and to use. And then uh, finally, it uh, as substantive changes. It also brings the insurance agreement language consistent with our uh, municipal uh, um, uh, GIC uh, verbiage. So, um, uh, in uh, executive session, we did take a vote, and I'll call for a vote in public session uh, by roll call to approve the um, uh, school committee, uh, town of North Andover, and the North Andover Cafeteria Staff Association's agreement as presented. Mr. Teresi? Aye. Yeah, yeah. We have to yes. move that first, right? Uh, we have to move. Do we have to have another motion in public session today? Um, oh. Robert's Rules of Order. So first, let me uh, take as a uh, let's see if there's a, a motion on the floor to approve the agreement um, as presented. So Thanks. moved. Okay. Second. And second. Now, can we call for any discussion? No. Great. So can we call for roll call for the uh, agreement? Aye. Aye. Mr. Lippert? Aye. Before? Aye. Aye. So it's 5 0, and I'll be executing this evening. Thank you. Um, moving on to our last topic uh, any public comment from our <laughs> copious public? <laughs> Did you want to introduce Dr. Bear? Yes, this is Dr. Carla Bear. She is my uh, coach as part of the new superintendent induction program and will be working with me um, six hours a month yes. and also working with me as I attend eight sessions this year as part of the program with the other 28 new superintendents in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Great. We're very happy mm -hmm. to have you and thank you so much for joining us on this uh, this meeting. Great. Um, so if no other public comment, uh, any school committee comment? Nothing? I, I have uh, two quick things. I mean, one, obviously, uh, school started and it, was, it seemed to be a great start, but I just want to congratulate Dr. Price on uh, starting the year, her first year as a superintendent. Um, so uh, I think things have gone very smoothly and uh, I thank you for your leadership and I know that uh, the parents that I've spoken to and the teachers are all uh, very excited and optimistic about that. I think the other amazing thing is we are having our meeting in the first, or our first meeting in the new uh, building and a number of parents have um, also commented on just the accessibility of it. Um, and I know it doesn't sound like much, but just being able to drive in and just walk in and be able to be here as opposed to going into 1600 and walking halfway through a parking lot and <laughs> through the maze of all of that to find the school administration building or offices is just, I think, a welcoming um, point. Um, and, and I thank the town for kind of partnering um, to do that. And I, and I think it's fantastic. And the other piece that is really uh, huge is Community Programs is now located in here. Mm -hmm. And I, was, uh, I had an opportunity to, spot, to speak with Rick before the meeting, and he said, you know, beforehand they would kind of go to Kittredge and they would, you know, sign their kids up for a uh, class or a session, and then they would have to go over to 1600 or 
put a phone call through in order to do busing and transportation issues with that. And now mm. they can kind of do that. They're able to kind of enter the building separately and then walk right down the hall and get that done. So I just think from a community perspective, um, this is a amazing addition for us. And I think it feels like home. So I hope it feels like home to you as well. Yeah, I so. would think I would just say um, from the central office perspective, we just love the location. I mean, we're able to walk to multiple buildings. I've been out walking. We've all been out walking um, this, this afternoon when kids were walking home from school. We we're all looking out. And it just helps us remind us why we actually exist. Um, and just a wonderful location. And I think the town, we feel so fortunate to have been moved here. Is that correct? We feel so lucky to be here. 100%. 100%. And it's one-stop shopping now. It's so much more convenient for parents. Mm -hmm. and, um, really, a big thanks to the community. Big thanks. Indeed. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. If nothing, motion to adjourn. Second. second. <laughs> <laughs> I can't call it. <laughs> okay, Mr. Lindbergh, and second. Second. <laughs>